welcome to the class of Convincing Law and Practice, a unit that is done in year four, semester one. My name is Dennis Kiora. The topic for today is the topic known as the contractual stage in conveyancing. One needs to understand that the interest in land can only be transferred by way of a contract. Now, this contract is largely governed by the general principles of the law of contracts, which means that there must be an offer, there must be an acceptance, there must be a consideration, and the parties must have intended to create a legal relationship. <clears throat> but what largely distinguishes contracts for sale of land from other contracts are the formalities that have to be complied with and the requirements, particular requirements that contracts for sale of land must satisfy. And this largely is because of the value that is attached to land. That therefore means that contracts for sale of land are a subject of a little bit more stringent conditions as opposed to the other ordinary contracts. Specifically, our law, under the Law of Contracts Act Cap 23, requires that every contract for sale of land must be written. What that means is that if a contract for sale of land is not written, such a contract cannot be enforced in a court of law. Now, these requirements, however, in some instances may not apply. For instance, if the transfer of land is by way of a public auction, or if it is an interest that has been created or that has resulted from an implied or constructive trust, then in such instances, the strict requirements for a sale of land agreement will not apply. Now, the Law of Contract Act, Section 3, Subsection 3, which requires that a contract for sale of land must be written, has also been replicated in Section 30, 38 of the Land Act, and, and that therefore means that a contract for sale of land must be written. A contract for sale of land cannot be oral, and this is as a result of a statutory requirement that a contract for sale of land must be written. But by and large, even before parties have entered into this contract for sale of land, certainly there has been certain other processes that have taken place. For instance, it is believed that by this stage, the buyer has conducted what we call a due diligence or in the lay language, what is typically known as a search. It is also hoped that by this point in time, there has been some kind of negotiation on the terms of the contract. There has been an offer and counter offers, and these offers and counter offers may have been exchanged between the parties. Um, an offer can originate from either side. It can originate from the buyer to the seller, or it can actually also originate from the seller to the buyer. The offer then that may have taken place between the parties before the actual stage of contract is more often likely to have been made subject to contract. Now, when the offer has been made subject to contract, what that means is that there is no contract and that the contract itself will come into effect when the parties have done that formal agreement that has been signed by the parties. The contract for sale of land usually has to be contained in that agreement for sale and which will then have to comply with the minimum requirements like writing, signing, execution, and even attestation. Now the beauty about conveyancing in our jurisdiction is that 
there are certain there are standard formats that have been developed by the Law Society of Kenya, um, which have been developed over time. And therefore, a person who is entering into a sale of land agreement can or is allowed to actually just go by these standard formats. Now, that format has, is normally known as the LSK conditions of sale. And this is contained in the edition of 2015, the year 2015. And it provides a template that can guide a conveyancer. And what you must also understand is that the LSK conditions of sale do not actually bind the parties to the contract, but it acts as a guide. What that means is that you are allowed to actually follow the conditions in entirety as they are, or you can amend, you can improve, you can alter. Like I have already said, it only acts as a guide. Now, if you look at the conditions of sale of 2015, therein, the conditions have set out what we call an agreement for sale layout. Now, this agreement for sale layout stipulates certain clauses and certain conditions that any conveyancer should consider as the minimum terms and conditions that should be set out in a properly drafted contract for sale um, um, contract for sale. I wish to reiterate that these conditions do not bind the parties to conveyancing, but they act as an important guide. And as much as is practicable, a conveyancer should try to comply with these conditions or even better to improve these conditions. Now, that simplified format for a sale agreement as a minimum should basically contain the following clauses. The first clause is a clause on commencement. And this typically is the clause that will prescribe the dates it will prescribe the, doc the parties. It will also prescribe the nature of the document. And the usual practice for this particular clause is basically to have it contained in a title page which summarizes the nature of the document, the date on, on, on which uh, the parties are entering into this uh, contract, and also the parties to the transaction. It is also usual as a minimum to also just describe the subject that is um, the subject of, of this particular agreement. And by subject here, we mean a brief description of the land description. It is also important to have an interpretation or definitions clause, and this typically will contain terms that are very special to the agreement, which then will be defined. It is advisable that any clause that is contained in the interpretation or a definitions clause is also capitalized at every point in time that it has been used in the body of the contract. Anyone reading the contract, whenever they come across this, this particular words and phrases that have been capitalized, they should be able to understand that these terms are technical terms, they are defined terms, and at every point in time, they need to make reference to the interpretation or definitions clause. The other important clause for every agreement for sale is what you call a recital clause. This clause typically gives the background of the transaction. It gives what I would perhaps even call the historical background of the transaction. And it begins with words like whereas. And it therefore states the nature of the proprietor's interest in the land, whether it is freehold or resold, and the history of the property. It could therefore talk about certain events that may have gone into the creation of the interest um, that we are talking about. It could also be giving um, an account of what will take place before the actual land that is being purchased has been realized. And by this we mean, for, for instance, um, processes like subdivisions. If 
the vendor or the seller will be required to undertake some kind of subdivision, then that particular background should be stated in the recital clause. And again, unless it is otherwise stated, property is never sold uh, together with fittings, but fixtures are normally deemed to be part and parcel of the property, and they therefore include, um, they are therefore included in the sale transaction. Now, another important clause that should be contained in the agreement for sale is what we call the consideration clause. Now, this clause will typically set out the purchase price. It will also set out the deposit payable. It will also prescribe how the balance should be paid. And by balance, we are perhaps looking at uh, the number of installments that will be paid, the intervals of those installments, and the value per installment. Now, the law of society conditions of sale prescribe that if parties do not agree otherwise, the deposit should be an equivalent of 10%. Remember again, this is just a guide of the conditions of sale. Parties can agree, uh, would typically agree even on a higher uh, percentage of deposit. And the balance, again, the LSK conditions of sale prescribe that the balance should at least be completed or paid within 14 days of registration of transfer in the name of the purchaser, but not later than the completion date. Now, I wish to advise that the completion clause must be constructed very carefully and it must also envisage the circumstances of each particular conveyancing process. And therefore, we cannot quite prescribe any particular terms and conditions that must go into the consideration clause. It is upon the conveyancer to really understand what the parties want to achieve and construct that very carefully in the consideration clause. It is also very normal that this particular clause will also uh, talk about um, if there will be any movement of um, what we call the completion documents, as we shall see in the completion clause. And I would therefore also want to say that the consideration clause will very intricately interact with the completion clause. Let me just discuss the two together. Now, the completion clause is the clause that prescribes the period within which the transaction should be completed. If parties have not agreed otherwise, the completion period typically is 90 days. Again, parties are free to agree on a shorter period or even on a longer period, but in the absence if of an agreement otherwise, the LSK conditions of sale will stipulate 90 days. 90 days. Now, now, during this period, usually the parties should have performed their obligations under the agreement. And the typical obligations that we are looking at here is that um, the, 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 the purchaser should have paid the balance of the purchase price and the vendor or the seller should by this time be able to produce um, the, the completion documents. Again, the process of completion, which I think will also be expounded even more in, in, in our topic number five, is that the completion documents should be released to the advocates of the purchaser and the balance of the purchase price should also should be released to the advocates of the vendor. We'll be able to see the documents that are normally uh, included in, in, the completion, in, the, in the completion stage. But by and large, I do advise that the consideration clause and the completion clause should be constructed in a very careful manner because the bulk of the disputes that arise 
in the context of conveyances typically would arise in in in, in, in under these uh, two particular clauses the consideration and the completion now the other clause that um that should be carefully constructed is a clause we call matters affecting the property now this typically would state if there are any specific or particular um, if there are any specific or particular conditions that must be complied with and in our instance we are perhaps looking at things like any easements any covenants rights restrictions etc that could be contained in the title and which could also limit the rights um, you know of the owner or the owner to be and in this case the purchaser and the property usually is normally sold free of any encumbrances like charges and and if there be such encumbrances like charges then they should also be stated in the agreement and the purchaser should be aware of these encumbrances it is possible that they can inherit the encumbrances but then again you also need to understand that certain other conditions may have to be complied with for instance you might require the consent of the chaji uh, before uh, the transfer can be effected but it would also be much wiser if such encumbrances are in fact discharged in the first place um, uh, before the transfer can be can be effected another important clause is what we call the possession clause and this typically will state the nature of possession that will be given to the purchaser and at what point in time this particular possession will be given to the purchaser and the usual practice is that the purchaser should be given should be granted or given a vacant possession unless otherwise uh, stated and where for example the purchaser is taking over existing tenants then again this particular position should be stated very clearly and that possession should normally be given on or before um, the completion unless the parties have agreed otherwise another very important clause is the clause on penalties or what you would call remedies for breach parties must envisage in their agreement what exactly should happen in the event of a breach by either the purchaser or the seller now this particular clause would set out the penalties against the party the party in breach or remedies available to the innocent party and before exercising their remedies the innocent party ought to serve at least a 21 days completion notice to the party in breach now this is what is prescribed under the LSK conditions of sale um, what we call um, a, a completion notice now if the purchaser is the one who is in breach the conditions of sale prescribe a penalty equivalent of a liquidation damage of 10 percent of the purchase price so if the purchaser is the one who is in breach the law will require that the purchaser forfeits an equivalent of 10 percent as liquidated damage and the 10 percent is the 10 percent of the value of the property again if the vendor and that is a seller is the one who is in breach typically the lsk conditions of sale require that such a vendor shall refund the deposit in full without any kind of deduction again i know once in a while purchasers uh, find it very unfair that the vendor in the event the purchaser breaches the vendor keeps the equivalent of 10 percent as a liquidated damage and at the same time um, find it quite unfair that if the vendor breaches he is only required to refund the deposit in full again like i said the lsk conditions of sale are merely a guide it is possible that the parties can prescribe 
a penalty even against the vendor. For instance, it is not unusual to find parties prescribing a, a refund of the deposit with an interest, perhaps at the commercial rate, um, from the time of the breach in favor of the purchaser. And that interest would typically be paid by the vendor. It is not unusual and it is not illegal if the parties prescribe that kind of a penalty in favor of the purchaser. Another important clause that should be contained in the sale of a land agreement is a clause incorporating the LSK conditions of sale. And what normally happens is that the parties incorporate the LSK conditions of sale as long as the same remain, they have not been varied or as long as they have not been inconsistent with the conditions of agreement. And it is important that parties are able to incorporate this clause because what that means is that if there are any omissions for one reason or another, then the LSK conditions of sale will step in to address such gaps. And therefore, I would encourage that every properly drafted agreement for sale should incorporate the LSK conditions of sale, which then will automatically take care of any gaps or of any omissions that may have been left out in the process of drafting the agreement for sale. What that means is that if you incorporate this particular clause, it will mean that the conditions of sale that have been amended or altered or valid in the agreement, they will apply as they are in the agreement. Those that have been retained as they are in the agreement will apply precisely as that. Right? And those that, if there are any conditions that may have been, for one reason or the other, inadvertently omitted, then the LSK conditions of sale will step in to basically address those gaps. Another important clause that should be contained in the agreement for sale is the clause on costs. Now this clause, parties normally will state who is responsible for payment of what costs. Typically, the parties will bear the costs of their respective advocates. What that means is that every party will pay, will bear the cost of the conveyancing fees for their advocates. Now, there are certain costs that, are, that, that also need to be borne in mind, and parties need to be clear who bears what costs. Now, costs like stamp duty and transfer costs will typically be borne by the purchaser. What that means, it's the business and the duty of the purchaser to pay the stamp duty cost and to also pay um, the transfer costs that are, will normally be paid to the government. But it is the seller as well also bears certain costs. For instance, it is the business of the seller to bear the costs of, say, survey fees. If there will, for example, be the process of subdivision, it is the business of the seller to pay the fees of the surveyor. It will also be the business of the seller to pay the cost of acquiring what we call the completion documents. Completion documents are things like consents. These documents will obviously come with costs. There, there will be documents like um, the rent clearance certificates. The rent clearance certificates, if it's a leasehold, this cost must be borne by the seller. And therefore, the seller also needs to know that it would be the duty of the seller to pay something we call the capital gains tax. Capital gains tax, which is the equivalent of 5% of the gain, this particular cost will also be borne by the seller. Again, parties need to construct the clause on costs so that you do not have a situation where in future parties disagree on who was supposed to bear what. But by and large, 
the LSK conditions of sale do guide us very clearly on who is supposed to bear what costs. And I think I've already summarized who is supposed to bear what costs. I have seen a scenario where, for example, there is a push and pull between a seller and a buyer, uh, particularly where a surveyor is involved. I want to clarify that if there is um, any kind of push and pull, it must be known that the person who pays the survey fees is the seller. It is a property of the seller and it is the business of the seller to subdivide that property and to put it in a manner that it can be conveyed and it is therefore the business of the seller to bear the costs of the surveyor. You will also typically have um, a miscellaneous clause um, uh, in your agreement and this particular clause will generally prescribe what we call, um, you know, uh, what, what, what we call the, boiler, the boilerplate clauses. The very normal and the very obvious clauses that are normally applicable in almost every uh, kind of agreement and uh, uh, typically in every kind of a sale of land agreement. And sometimes these clauses do appear in almost every type of an agreement. Uh, things like uh, the no waivers uh, clause, um, the cumulative remedies, the severability, um, you know, the enduring nature of contract uh, and ETC. Another important clause is the clause on notices. And this particular clause will typically uh, stipulate the manner, the form, and the period of notices um, to any party in the agreement. If you are to give any kind of notice, either the seller or the buyer, what kind of periods should you give? How many days notice? What should be the nature of the notice? Can you, should it be written? Should it, can it be done by way of an email? Uh, is it, um, what, what, what kind of notice? Um, it is important bearing in mind the law of evidence. It is important bearing the law of evidence that notices be given in a manner that it can be verified. Notices be given in a manner um, that can be evidenced. And therefore, I would advise very strongly that whenever parties prescribe the clause on notices, it is very important that you prescribe notices that can be verified, notices that can be evidenced, notices that can be proven. I would very strongly uh, advise against things like oral notices to the parties. Now, the typical period of notices as prescribed under the LSK conditions of sale um, will, will be just about 14 days notice. But then again, parties can agree on a shorter period and equally they can also agree on a longer period. Another important clause that should be contained in a properly drafted agreement for sale is what we call the jurisdiction clause. This particular clause will typically stipulate the law that will govern the agreement. Whether in the context of a dispute or in the context of arbitration, it will prescribe the law that will be applicable. Again, it is very important that this particular clause is, is constructed very carefully. Um, and I would also advise there should be no reason why for a property that is located in our jurisdiction, there is no reason why an external law should be applicable and there is no reason why the, any adjudication of the disputes should be outside our jurisdiction. So therefore, I would advise that the law applicable should be the Kenyan law and the place for any kind of adjudication in the event of, of a dispute, it should be either by way of arbitration in our jurisdiction or it can also be by way of um, uh, through the Kenyan, the Kenyan courts. Again, I would advise that please uh, do, not, do not appear to play around with the jurisdiction clause. Um, for certain other commercial agreements, I have seen people who have readily accepted application of other external laws 
and um, or even um, adjudication by other external courts um, without without giving it much of a thought. And when disputes have arisen, uh, courts have appeared to interpret the jurisdiction clause very strictly, and you could find yourself then having to uh, having your dispute having to be determined in a foreign jurisdiction, and that would not be very encouraging. Now, that then basically constitutes the body, the body of the agreement. We have looked at the recital clause. The recital clause is the one that basically connects, um, is the one that connects the commencement uh, clause to the body of the agreement. Now, after you have completed constructing the body of your agreement, we then have to have what we call the testimonium clause. Now, this is the clause that links the body of the agreement to the part of execution. Now, you will find that this is a clause that normally would begin with words like in witness whereof. It is a conclusion that parties have agreed all the terms that have, uh, that have preceded this particular clause and they now feel that they are ready to append their signatures to confirm um, their agreement, to confirm that there is a consensus and idem um, and, and that they all are comfortable with the agreement. You could also have words like thus done and signed. It is also possible that this particular clause can also um, can have a date, can have a part for the date, other than whatever is contained in the commencement clause. It would not be legal if you have got a date appearing in the testimonium clause and also a date also appearing in the commencement clause, um, but you can have any of the dates, you can have one, you can have both. Of course, provided again, these dates are not, uh, are not different. Remember, again, let me also explain for purposes of um, the commencement, it is possible that the date that appears, um, the date of execution can be different from the date of commencement. So it is possible that parties can actually sign their agreement this day in as much as it has either commenced previously or it is going to commence at a future uh, period of time. The other clause is what we call the execution clause. Now this is where the parties will sign or they will seal the agreement if, it is, uh, if you're talking about a company. Now in terms of section 44 of the Land Registration Act, all the parties consenting to an instrument that effects a disposition in land are required to sign, to execute by way of a signature, or they can also place a thumb print or any other uh, mark that is acceptable. Parties are required by law to undertake this particular process actively by themselves. Of course, unless if um, there is uh, perhaps what we call a power of attorney, whereby uh, someone is exercising some powers of attorney to execute on behalf of a party, um, but otherwise, if that is not the position, um, the, uh, the, the parties are supposed to execute by themselves um, unless there is that power of attorney in place, which must be properly uh, prepared properly registered for it to have effect in law. If the execution then again is by a body corporate or an association or a corporate society, it should also be done in the presence of an advocate or a magistrate or a judge or a, not, or a, or a notary public um, who shall then also uh, complete the certificate of attestation. It is important to understand that the signature of a company is exercised by way of a seal. The directors merely witness that particular signature by the company
which is done by way of a sale, and then thereafter, an advocate should then witness um, the signatures of the directors and, and, and the signature of the directors who have then also witnessed the signature of the company. The last uh, and equally very important clause is, the, is a clause on attestation or verification. Now, this particular clause basically is about witnessing of the execution. It will typically be done by the conveyancing advocates. So we are saying that here, the witness signs in witness to the execution and then gives a certificate of attestation or verification. This clause is about witnessing. The signatures that have been placed, the executions that have been done by the vendor and by the purchaser need to be witnessed. This is, um, is really an, an evidential issue because if an agreement is not properly witnessed and a dispute arises, um, it could bring a lot of other complications in terms of, for, for instance, even exactly proving who is saying the truth and who is not saying the truth. So again, a properly drafted agreement for sale should be executed and it is also important that such execution is done by a professional advocate because they are the ones who really understand the implications of these processes, particularly in the events um, that a dispute arises between the parties. Now, under Section 45 of the LRA, that's the Land Registration Act, it provides that a person executing an instrument shall appear before the land registrar, a public officer, or other person including a judge or magistrate, a registrar or a deputy registrar of the High Court, registrar general or his deputy registrar, an administrative officer, a superintendent of the, of, of the prisons, an advocate or a bank official. This appear to be the individuals who are authorized, who are properly authorized by law to witness executions of conveyancing documents. For authenticity, for legality, for proper clarity, it is important that um, uh, uh, these documents are attested by the properly authorized um, persons in law. Now, in appearing before the prescribed person, the party executing must be accompanied by a credible witness for the purpose of establishing their identity, unless the party who is supposed to execute is, of course, very well known to the prescribed person. And that prescribed person has to identify the person very precisely and must also be able to ascertain whether the party freely and voluntarily executed the instrument and thereafter then can complete a certificate to that effect. In conclusion, I would want to say that the convincing advocates must ensure that the instrument in the form of a sale of land agreement is properly drafted, is drafted with clarity, and it must be free of any vagueness. Because in the event of any vagueness, the courts could easily dismiss even such, um, um, uh, such an agreement or could dismiss the dispute um, uh, uh, for lack of clarity um, uh, because of, 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 of vagueness. It is the duty of the convincing advocates to ensure that the agreement is properly drafted. It is the duty of the convincing advocate to ensure that the parties understand the full implication of every term that is contained in an agreement for sale. I would also very strongly discourage parties writing agreements for sale of land on their own without the assistance of professional interventions because in the event of a dispute, such parties would have a lot of problems.
Thank you very much. That is the end of our lesson. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.